Hello, everybody. My name is Tony Martin Vege, and my talk today is titled How Fair Analyses Support Decision Making at Netflix. And I'm going to be talking about how Netflix uses fair for decision making and decision analysis. Netflix is very data driven to begin with, and we're very quantitatively minded in many areas of the business. So, fair is a natural fit for management in general, not only risk management. I've seen many fair based programs at companies in the past, and one attribute sets Netflix apart there's a focused effort to use fair as decision support. And what this means is that we are using FAIR much earlier in the decision-making process. Hopefully, we're driving better outcomes with this. In the next 30 minutes, I'm going to share with you how we conceptually think about risk, how we think about decision support, how we use FAIR for decision support, and give you a couple tangible examples of how we operationalize this. Last, I'll give you a couple of takeaways of how you can integrate some of these concepts into your risk program. So before I get too deep, here's a little bit more about me. So again, my name is Tony Martin Vagie, and you all have no idea how excited I am to be here. FairCon is one of my favorite conferences. This is my fifth FairCon, and I spoke at the very first one, and that was in 2016. So I'm really excited to be back and thank you to the Fair Institute for inviting me back. Um, I'm on the risk team at Netflix. I'm a senior risk engineer, and our team uses FAIR exclusively throughout various areas of the business using um, FAIR to model information security risk. Other quantitative risk models are used in other areas of the business, but the information security team uses FAIR. I'm also the co-chair of the San Francisco Bay Area chapter of the FAIR Institute. I believe we're the oldest chapter, started maybe in 2015, um, if, I, if I remember correctly. And of course, if you have any questions, please use the chat box, or um, after the conference, you can reach out to me at any time with any question. My contact information is here up on the slide. Whenever I think about decision making, I think of this Yogi Berra quote. When you come to a fork in the road, take it. And the reason why I love this is it's saying, hey, take action, seize the moment. Sometimes no decision is worse than a bad decision. And in life, we often have several paths we can take. This fork in the road, these several paths are all the more present in business decisions where real stakes are involved. It's usually a lot of money, a lot of livelihood. So of course, using a structured analysis framework like FAIR helps us all make better decisions with the best possible outcome. So as I mentioned, Netflix is very data-driven. We have a culture internally that promotes structured de decision-making. Individual contributors and managers alike are encouraged to take very strong positions, very strong opinions about various things. It could be information security, but it could also be any aspect of the business and elicit feedback on those positions and opinions. So an example of this would be, say one team wants to increase the security of, um, of our cloud posture. They would take a particular position on security and start to elicit feedback. Um, that position, that opinion has to be backed up with data and analysis or else they're not going to get very far. You can't use conjecture and you certainly can't use fear, uncertainty and doubt. So very early on when I started at Netflix, feedback I got from my colleagues and from management is that we don't want a traditional risk register. We don't want to have just this endless list of issues. Sometimes some of those issues are arbitrary. And on each one of them, we're forced to select a treatment option. It's usually mitigate. We're forced to mitigate. The problem with this is that risk registers don't often convey the trade-offs involved with risk mitigation. What I mean by that is, there is always a balance between security and business objectives, 
end user friction, opportunity cost, project cost, et cetera. So this is what a traditional risk register might look like. It is very difficult to make decisions based on colors, as I'm sure most of the attendees today will attest to. One problem out of many is that you can't compare project cost versus risk exposure reduction with colors. Um, another problem, take, uh, take this example here, the 30 Windows servers out of patch compliance, and also take a look at server room lock is broken. Sometimes there's no decision to be made. So let's suppose with both of those issues, we have a policy that says that servers have to be patched within a certain tolerance, server rooms must always be locked. Why do you need a risk analysis? These are issues. An issue is a realized risk. It's already happened. We don't need a risk analysis on it. So a lot of these things belong on an incident report and not necessarily a risk register. And last, take a look at data breach. So this is pretty ambiguous. What do you mean by data breach exactly? So my question back would be, what do you mean by data breaches? What would you like to know about data breaches? Are we covered from a cyber insurance standpoint? Maybe you want to know if we're overexposed. Maybe we're underexposed to data breach. And yes, there really is a such thing as being underexposed to risk, even data breach risk. As counterintuitive as that might sound, it might mean there's way too much end user friction from a security standpoint. Maybe the business isn't taking enough risk. We're not risk seeking enough to achieve our business objectives. And FAIR can help answer both of these and all of the above questions where a typical red, yellow, green risk register cannot. A lot of these decisions are much more nuanced than the information that can be conveyed with this risk register. So overwhelmingly, people want help in making business decisions, which information security risk is just a part of a business decision, of course, but security decisions are just business decisions. So let me show you how a business decision in which FAIR is a component of would present itself. So we're all familiar with this. This is the FAIR ontology. This helps us understand our exposure to loss. So what would happen if we take a step back and think of FAIR in the context of a business decision? and not just from a risk perspective or the risk analyst perspective. So when we think about it in terms of the business, the true complexity of the problem is now revealed. So here's an example decision. Should the company invest in a DLP project, data loss prevention? Typical risk reporting would report the risk of data leakage from employees as red. That's what DLP protects against primarily is data leakage from employees. And then we could say that DLP brings it from red to yellow. It is really hard to make a good decision off of this data, red to yellow, that's hard. So let's take a step back and think about this from the standpoint of the entire decision. So if we implement DLP, what are we giving up? Are we giving up another security project like upgrading our SIM? Maybe we're giving up a business proposal, expanding into a, a new market. We only have money for one, expand into a new market or implement DLP. This is called opportunity cost, the loss of potential gain from other alternatives. FAIR can help answer risk-related opportunity cost and we do this quite often at Netflix. We, we are running two analyses and we're comparing them. Once you have that, you can take it to the next step. So the next question would be, by how much does the DLP project reduce risk? Red to yellow doesn't tell us that. We use FAIR to run two analyses. So the first analysis is a baseline of current risk. 
This is a forecast of annualized risk with no DLP. We call this our baseline. Now we run a second analysis, and that's our forecast of annualized risk with DLP. We just put in DLP. Now we can compare the two. So let's suppose that our baseline of risk, this one, is $100 million. That's our risk today. DLP reduces it in half. 50% reduction, 50 million of annualized risk exposure. Now we have a data point. This is something that decision makers can use to help them make a decision. But that's not the full picture. We usually don't stop there. Now that we know our expected risk reduction, we can then figure out what the project cost is. So if the cost of the project, the cost of DLP from beginning to end is more than 50 million, is it worth it? Probably not. The cost of the project exceeds our expected risk reduction. So it's really not a good deal. Uh, this is called cost-benefit analysis, the ratio of cost to expected benefit. And using all three of these, uh, along with FAIR, can really help paint a, uh, a much better picture for decision makers. Now your question for me might be, how do I actually implement something like this in my company? How do I, how do I bring decision analysis closer to, uh, to decision makers? And the way to do that, I believe, is we all need to start conceptualizing the risk life cycle differently. Now, I'm not proposing a change to risk management. Risk management is good. There's a lot of good frameworks out there, like NIST RMF, Risk IT, um, COBIT-5. Those are really good, and we keep doing this. Uh, we use those too, and they're really good at helping conceptualize um, the risk management life cycle. I'm talking about what occurs outside of the risk management life cycle. Um, so what you see on your screen here is a compliance focused risk program. So the decision maker comes to a fork in the road. They have a decision to make. Should I implement DLP or should I break my product into a new market this year? I only have enough money for one. Which one should I do? Then the, the decision maker makes a decision. Let's say they decide to break into a new market. Then an issue is discovered. We are seeing massive data leak from employees. So let's go ahead and throw that on the risk register, scope the assessment, and then the risk enters the risk management life cycle. So the problem with this is the risk analyst comes in way too late. It's already become an issue. It's a realized risk. It's not really a risk anymore. We didn't really help the decision maker make a decision. We're just going through the risk management life cycle and we're not really helping anybody. So you can see the red box here. The risk team gets involved at the, ta at the tail end. It's too late. So how do we conceptualize this differently? I want to bring the risk analyst closer to the, to the decision maker and their decision. So the decision maker comes to a fork in the road. Should I implement DLP or should I break my product into a new market? I only have enough money for one this year. The risk analyst helps them identify their choices, the preferences, and the information that we have at hand to help us make the decision. Then we sit down with the decision maker and form a decision statement or a series of decision statements. A decision statement is not unlike a risk statement. It's an unambiguous sentence or, or a set of sentences that describe the decision we're trying to make with our choices, our preferences, and our information. Then we can perform the risk assessment, scope it out, and whatever risks come up can enter the risk management life cycle. And as you can see with this red box here, compare it to the other red box I had, we are involved much earlier. We, we are involved before the, the decision maker decides to purchase anything or enter a new market or, or really anything. Um, we're still using the risk management life cycle, but the key difference here is we're not waiting until it's a problem for the company. 
we are performing a fair analysis before it's a problem for the company, much earlier in, in, uh, in the decision. So I briefly mentioned choice, preference, and information. And it's so important as far as components of a decision. I, I want to take a few moments and dive into that a little bit deeper. So this was pioneered by Ron Howard. He is one of the leading thinkers on decision science. And this was outlined in one of his books, Foundations of Decision Analysis. And there's three components of a decision. And the first component we have is choice. And this describes what the decision maker can do. If there's only one course of action, there's not a decision to be made. You don't need a risk analysis. The second is preferences. The decision maker has to have a preference or some inclination for a desired outcome. And preferences are really important to gather when you're scoping out a risk analysis. So for example, in cyber risk, the decision maker might have a preference to optimize user functionality or reduce end user friction. We might have a preference for effective security or very strong security. Oftentimes I find decision makers have a preference for efficient resource allocation. And by resource allocation, I mean money, time, or people. Sometimes we see a combination of all of the above. And the last component of a decision is information. And this is information that can be applied when you're making a risk analysis. This is all of your data, all of the expertise, all your subject matter experts, anything that you can gather that can help you make a decision. And information is an equal part of the trio. Now, of course, the entire decision is wrapped in logic. Logic is the pillar for the entire process, and without logic, the decision would fail. So now that we know the components of a decision, and we know that we need to move fair analysis, and we need to move ourselves closer to the decision maker, what kinds of decisions can we use fair to analyze? It really depends on your management point of view. Specifically, what kinds of questions do you want answered? C-level people or the board, they're really interested in existential questions, things that can make the company shut down or cause significant material damage. Now, other people, on the other hand, such as security architects, engineers, pen testers, they're going to have really nuts and bolts questions, very detailed questions. And that's what I mean by management point of view. The skill here is learning how and where to fit fair analyses to the decision. And at Netflix, we call this the level of abstraction, the abstraction level. The, what we wanna do is determine the level of abstraction for your analysis, and that helps fit the decision. We generally use three categories. This is loosely based on the NIST risk management framework, their tiering system. Uh, we have tier one, and that supports strategic decision making. Think of this as a 40,000 foot view or even higher, really high level. Tier two is a step down, and this supports tactical decision making. And tier three is they're really those nuts and bolts questions that I, I was mentioning earlier. This supports operational decision making. Which level you use really depends on the level of management you're at in the company, your roles and responsibilities, and those types of specific questions that you want answered. And I'm going to give some examples in, in the next few slides. So let's dig a little bit deeper into these three tiers. So first we have tier one, strategic decision making. This is a short list. This might be five or 10, really no more than 10, but these are systemic, existential, or persistent company risks that senior management needs to be aware of and help make decisions on. This is most often a C-level report or a board report that's reported quarterly or as needed. And I found that some risks are always on there, like 
major system outages, pandemics, data breach risk, other risks cycle in and out based on what the business is doing. So you might have merger and acquisition risk on there, and then it comes off when mergers and acquisitions are complete. And how it's used. So this is a portfolio view that C-level leadership or board leadership uses to make strategic investment decisions. And think about this as being five years out. They're making strategic planning decisions that help guide the company five years. So here's a couple of examples of decisions you can make with FAIR. Um, it, you could analyze in-house versus outsource code development. Should we do our programming with employees here in our facilities or do we outsource it out? That's five-year planning. That's not something that you can do tomorrow or next week. This is strategic alignment of the company. Um, next one is deploying services to cloud versus in-house hosting. This is a really big decision that usually, usually involves C-level people. Again, this, this is five years out. This is really, really difficult to try to answer um, immediately. You really need um, a lot of experts in the room and fair analysis helps. Um, so I wanna stress that these aren't fair scenarios. These are business questions that can be answered with FAIR, and you want to use the FAIR scoping methodology to further identify the individual assets, threats, effects, et cetera. Um, each one of these might be five or six separate FAIR analyses that you're running on different threats, different assets, and then you collect them together, you aggregate them together to help make a decision. Uh, so tactical decision making, tier two. This might be 60, 100, 200 risks, depending on the size of your company. Um, it's expanded, and these would be risks across platforms, technologies, threat actors, department, asset classes. So you can see that it's a step down and how it's used. So more often than not, this is really effective at running cost benefit analysis of proposed initiatives you can help departments with one year budget and headcount planning. You can also see how your past security investments are working. It's really effective for that. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples here. Um, enterprise architecture decisions. So this is really good for tier two tactical decision making. How do we back up data as far as frequency and methodology? What type of disk storage should we use? Should we use Linux or Windows? Um, do we employ server virtualization? If so, what technology? Um, these aren't fully formed risk scenarios, as I mentioned. These are business decisions. So each one of these might be several fair analyses that you're doing, and you're presenting that to decision makers to help them make their decision. It's just another data point. Uh, the last one is, of course, tier three. This is operational decision making. This would eventually be thousands of risks, uh, thousands of fair analyses, and these are detailed analysis of individual assets. And I like to think of these as engine parts. This really helps aid operational decisions. You can compare one control versus another control. Let's say you have a list of projects or a list of sprints. You want to make a risk-based decision on which ones to prioritize. So you can use FAIR to, um, to help you prioritize those. Those are tier three decisions. And some examples would be decisions around endpoint protection. So what antivirus software should we use? What should the frequency of updating be? Should we use full disk encryption? And if so, on what assets? How do we configure our DLP? Do we do full disk backup? Um, what physical security controls are most effective to mitigate insider risks, uh, insider threats? These are really nuts and bolts decisions. Uh, this, was, this one's my favorite, the last one, because it comes up so often, for me at least. Should I remediate pen test finding number 31 or number 12 first? I want to do it in a risk-based way. 
So we would do a fair analysis on number 31, number 12, compare the two. Oh, I think you should do number 12 first that has a higher loss exposure. So what I really want to stress here is that framing risk in the form of decisions and not just bad things, but thinking about it as decisions enables you to make comparisons between two or more things. And when you're making comparisons, you can see the balance completely. And we miss this in a lot of risk shops, especially those that use red, yellow, green. We're missing the balance. And it is, it's always a balance. You have the potential risk of doing business. This is something that we're familiar with. We can always point out the risk of doing business. But on the other side of that, there's the reward of business, profit. All business is risk. All businesses engage in risk-seeking behavior. So we can't forget that there's always, um, always uh, rewards of, um, of risk-seeking. Next is security projects. So you have a security project, which we can run fair analyses on, but the other side of that, the balance is opportunity cost. What am I giving up by engaging in this project? And that's something that business leaders need help making decisions on. Last is increased security. So we're always advocating for increased security, right? But the flip side to that is for every increased security control, a lot of times that increase increases in user friction. So we want a balance. We want a balance between security and in, in user friction usability. Fair analysis can help us with all of these and, and a lot more. And if you're familiar with FAIR and the risk management stack, this is going to sound really familiar to you, that this really is inspired by FAIR's risk management stack. And the risk management stack is essentially accurate models such as FAIR enables meaningful measurements, which enables effective comparisons, which is what we're doing here, well-informed decisions, which is the theme of my entire talk, which gives us cost-effective risk management. And that's the goal of FAIR all along, cost-effective management. So I have a couple of, of key takeaways of how you can implement this at your company. So I think first and foremost, you want to move fair analysis and your fair risk analyst, the actual personnel, you want to move them closer to the decision makers and move them closer to the decision. Don't wait until it's become a problem. Don't perform fair analysis on issues. You only, wanting, you only want to do it on risk. Risk is a forecast. Risk has uncertainty. So if, you're, if your risk register has realized risk on it, you might be, um, might be barking up the wrong tree. So you want to really focus on risk, forecasting, and decisions. Next is scoping the analysis to fit the decision. This is really important. And this is where you can use choice, preferences, and information the decision science framework to help understand what the decision is and scope your fair analysis to help, help fit that. Another thing um, I'd like you all to keep in mind is different levels of abstraction for your fair analysis. So of course, the higher you get up in abstraction, the longer term it is, the more strategic your decision is. So the key here to success is know your audience. Does your audience want a five-year risk analysis that, that takes a look five years out and helps answer existential risk to the business? Or are you trying to answer, should I do pen test number 12 or number 31 first? You have to know your audience and fit the fair analysis to that person or to the question being asked. And last, it's always a balance between risk and reward. Risk isn't necessarily bad. We all engage in risk-seeking behavior. That's a good thing or else there wouldn't be any business. And try to understand that it is always a balance and use FAIR to, um, to help guide that. So I want to say thank you everybody for, for coming. 
Um, I hope everybody enjoys the rest of your conference. I know I am. I'm looking forward to the rest of the sessions. So thank you again for joining me.